Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I'm like born again with the trace minerals. I feel like running around and shaking everybody on the shoulders and going, you have got to do this for your horse. It's just like, it's like a miracle. He's great. Whenever I have a question, I'm like, Scott. Yeah. (laughs) Now, a few of them have been on the fence about ordering some Mad Barn for their horses. And I'm like, do it. You'll be so happy if you did it. That's like just the sweetest. I remember when I actually first came across Mad Barn and I was shocked, just sort of surprised that I got an email back from the founder of the company and he was just super genuine and generous with all sending me the data, sending me the information that he had done. And he's tip top. I love Scott. I'm looking forward to hearing the episode. So if you listen to my Nutrition in the Hoof podcast episode with Sally Hug last year, you know that I'm pretty obsessed with diet when it comes to hoof care. I always talk to my clients about mineral balancing and looking at hay testing if possible and trying to make sure that the diet the horse is on is going to be beneficial to the feet. So when I reached out to Mad Barn in Canada to see if they would do a podcast episode, the founder, Scott, was more than happy to chat with me about how nutrition can affect the feet. And side note, thank you so much to Mad Barn for sponsoring this episode of the Humble Hoof Podcast. If you would like to try some of their products to better your horse's nutrition program, use the code THEHUMBLEHOOF to get 5% off your order at madbarn.com. Hi, my name is uh, Scott Tixler. I'm the founder and lead nutritionist with Mad Barn Inc., a nutrition company located in Ontario, Canada. To give you some background, I guess, on how I ended up here, how we got to where we are today. I grew up around racehorses, around standard bred racehorses. I actually grew up on a mixed farm cash cropping operation. And then my father bought a brood mare, bred the mare, and we raised the foals up and started raising them. And then I started working for trainers in the standard bred industry and then through university, studied nutrition physiology, got an undergrad in Bachelor of Science at Guelph. And during that time there, I worked again in the racing industry on a breeding farm, one of the largest actually in Ontario at the time, did full watch, which was a convenient way to be able to work 40 hours a week and still go to school full time. And so I learned a lot from you know, I guess all the different facets of the industry and the, the life cycle too of the horse, I guess, being everything from full watch all the way through racing and retirement. And that was really the focus when I was in my undergrad and started getting into research was looking at exercise physiology and nutrition. Now... I had planned on doing a master's in that exercise physiology and nutrition, but uh, took a different direction. Actually, ended up studying ruminant nutrition for my master's while basically doing some side projects in equine nutrition and physiology, specifically looking at electrolyte balance and performance horses uh, and endurance horses. And so I've always had a keen interest in horses. Work kind of took me away from it for a little while as I got uh, ended up working for a feed company after I finished my master's. Uh, and then from that standpoint, because horses from a feed company standpoint aren't a primary species, uh, it's usually swine, uh, dairy, beef, and poultry. And so that became a larger focus for a number of years. And then we ended up working for suppliers of feed companies or an ingredient supplier. And it was a great opportunity because they were really focused on natural products, gut health products, which we'll get to, I guess, how it came into Mad Barn, some of the gut health things. You know, antibiotic-free programs that you see now, which are much more prevalent today than where they were at the time. They were kind of just on the in their infancy at that time, changing the way we feed our agricultural species. Again, I always kept horses in my life throughout this period of time. I, you know, what people I guess typically call a side hustle now, I was doing on the side all along through my connection in the feed industry. I had access to all the ingredients and the ability to make mineral and vitamin mixes. I had formulated my own, uh, was using it on our horses, and then just slowly other people started using it as well. And that was kind of the side hustle. It was just me making mineral and vitamins for people. And it wasn't until I met some barefoot trimmers in Quebec and they were like, you have to make this a business. Like, we just need this product in Canada. We need this expertise in Canada. And it was, they were uh, actually big followers of Pete Ramey. 
And was my introduction actually as well to the ECIR group. Up to that point, again, it was very performance horse focused. And so this idea of insulin resistance and metabolic disease wasn't really on my radar at that time. It has since then become, I guess, a much bigger component. Of it. And then from there, I actually was working for the supplier. I'd been there for five years or so and decided to go back and do a PhD. Uh, at Guelph, in which time I went out on my own doing nutrition consulting. But mainly, it was mainly actually dairy consulting at the time again, because the horse industry is not really set up for independent consultants on the nutrition side. There's a few, a few out there. I just felt it was going to be a difficult way to go. And so from there, I was like, but I still want to be involved in the horse industry. Now that I've started this nutrition consulting, let's make the equine nutrition side into a business as well. And a lot of that came about because the side hustle was now taking a considerable amount of time in terms of production and just servicing clients. And we we're like, okay, well, let's make this a legit business, not just a side hustle. And then that's where Mad Barn was born. And so that was six years ago, I guess, five, five six years ago now that uh, we officially became Mad Barn. And originally, I had only ever intended it to be a nutrition company. So we were going to sell minerals and vitamins and their mixes and use that as a way to fund our research program to really develop out our nutrition model for horses because it's really lacking in terms of where we're at for equine nutrition compared to other species. And I have some background in modeling. Uh, we're having worked with Dr. John Kant, assembling, working on assembling this team to start turning our nutrition model into a dynamic mechanistic model, uh, which we just don't have in the equine nutrition world at this point in time. That's a long way, I guess, the getting here. No, that's great. And so you, I know that you're based in Canada, but you sell your supplements to the States. Do you ship them to any other countries? Uh, right now, we're just strictly Canada and the U.S. Growing very rapidly at this point. So I didn't want to lose focus and start to do things wrong. Like we're a very customer centric based business. Uh, we spend a lot of time interacting with our customers, communicating with them, helping with them with their nutrition programs. And I just wanted to make sure we have all the systems that we can maintain that even as we grow, where we don't start to lose the focus on the customer and servicing them and what they need. Because ultimately that's why I did this was one, so I could pursue my interest in equine research and fund it myself, essentially through the sales of our products. And then two is just to help horse owners who, you know, when you only own one or two horses, it's difficult to justify the high cost of an individual nutrition consultation, or it, it, sometimes it's just hard to find anybody with expertise that's willing to spend the time with you. Right. Uh, and so we're trying to trying to find a way to bridge that gap for people so that, you know, you don't have to have 50 horses to get the correct information that you need and to get good information and dietary information for your horse and what you should be doing. My name is Rose Weinberg. I'm pretty obsessed with hoof health in like a kind of nerdy and weird way, which I guess everyone listening to this is. So hello to my tribe of humans. And yeah, I guess for me, finding Mad Barn is really great. I mean, I'm in Canada and so it's really nice to not have to find a great cost on a product and then have to add the shipping and like trying to get it from the state. So the fact that it's been a super huge bonus for me. I started sort of getting into both health and both nutrition. The little horse that I have who had an avicular diagnosis and I fell into it in like a very backwards, non-intentional way where I just sort of learned to trim because I put her out in a field and my barrier couldn't make it there that often because it was super far away. And once I was actually looking at her foot without a shoe on it all the time and noticing what a dynamic structure it is, that kind of led me to doing a little bit more research and led me to finding Ramey stuff. So that's sort of where I went down the rabbit hole of nutrition. And based on research and trying to find products that were available to me, I started off with the Omneity from Mad Burn. And then when I was able to get hay tested, I moved to a custom blend. And I've actually moved one of my horses recently and was like Scott was super sweet. I sent him a message asking about hay testing. So we have a provincial lab who does it and they do not give any instructions. Like, so they don't have like a handy equine test. It's just like a very baffling list of options. <laughs> so I sent it over to Scott. I just sent him a list. It was like, please help me. What do I need? And yesterday or the day before I actually just got back to me, 
telling me exactly what I needed and what uh, what test I should ask for, and giving me some sort of handy little tips to attest. So yeah, I don't know. I couldn't really be happier with Madburn and the results I've seen in both of my horses' feet since I've had them on their products is wild. Like it's it's crazy how different it is once their diets are balanced, and it makes it super easy to do it when you can just send out what you need and get a great product back. Yeah, and as a, a hoof care provider, I think I'm always looking for ways that nutrition can help the feet, you know, and help improve everything from their frogs to their soul depth to their white line connection, their hoof horn. And something that I know that I get asked about a lot, and I'm sure you do too, is iron and how we have an abundance of iron in so many places. So how do we approach that when it comes to feeding and supplementation? So I didn't know if you could comment a little on on iron in horses' diets. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a big question. Yeah. Like, you know, for, for a very short question, you know, I could probably spend the next two hours just talking about it. it, it it's interesting because you know iron. Certainly in the world with, met, with metabolic horses, it's almost like this toxic element you don't want. Yet it's so essential for all life. And it's so ubiquitous. It's in everything, right? I, I mean, that's one of the common questions I get is, can you make us a mineral that's iron-free? And I'm like, well, that's next to impossible. You know, without going to great expense and time to purify ingredients, uh, which just wouldn't be practical, you're going to have iron in it. And I was just reading, actually, iron deficiency is still one of the number one deficiencies in the human population globally, yet here in the horse population, we have this overabundance of it typically, and that's because of herbivores. Iron is the second most abundant element in the earth, so therefore your soils have a lot of it, therefore your plants end up having quite high concentrations of iron, and then the horse consumes the forage, and typically is getting far too much iron in their diet. Now normally, for horse, healthy horses, this isn't that big of a deal. They can tolerate the high levels of iron, but then you move into these insulin-resistant metabolic horses that seem to be quite sensitive to iron. It does create issues. And then you also have an entire feed industry that, you know, from years gone by, and I would blame this largely on the race horse population, is the, the idea of supplementing iron would create more hemoglobin or more oxygen carrying capacity in these horses. And therefore, iron is now supplemented in most supplement feeds you see. Now, there are some regulatory reasons for that as well on occasion, but that's, I think it's still a lot of times it's added in there, not because of the regulations, but because the racehorse people wanted high levels of iron for, because of this perceived benefit that it would do this when in fact it actually doesn't do that at all iron deficiency in a horse is so rare that we don't even talk about it so the idea that we needed to supplement any iron into their diets is totally unfounded and again you know this is a question we often get with our products is again, the iron free idea because we list iron on our fee tags but we do that for two, well, two reasons one's regulatory you have to list it number two is even if we didn't have to, because in the state, in some states, you don't have to list iron on the feed tags, we would still put it on there just so people would know what the level actually is. And so when they're doing their calculations, if they're that involved in their horse's nutrition about how much copper and how much iron they're getting, they know when they're feeding our products, this is how much they're getting. The other thing with iron, too, is that there's, there's a lot we really don't know. Like when you start looking at studies of iron of actual absorption, in horses, it's quite, well, at first there's not a lot in horses, but when you go across species, it's hugely variable. So an animal that's deficient, the absorption of iron can go upwards of 70% from heme iron, and it can go down as low as 1% to 2% from plant-based sources of iron. So there is, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into how much iron is absorbed. And I found in our, the people who I talk to anyways, there's this huge focus on how much iron's in their hay, and then they totally forget about their water source, which would be a soluble form of iron, which would be much, much more bioavailable than what's in the hay. Yeah, actually, I had heard of that with a client of mine who installed a water filtration system, and they had, her horses had a lot of issues before she installed that, um, and their iron blood work came back really high, too, and she had mentioned to me that she thought the water, the iron in the water was much more bioavailable than in hay. Yes, 
Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's already solubilized, so the absorb it's much more readily absorbed. A lot of the iron in hay is bound, so if it's phytate bound, won't be absorbed by the horse at all. The same with it actually goes for supplements too. Like, you know, one of the main contaminating sources of iron in mineral vitamin premixes are the calcium carbonates and dicalcium phosphate, or monocalcium phosphate in particular, are the big ones that have high levels of iron. But the availability of that iron is actually quite low. Like, not much of that gets absorbed. So all the number, when we look at absolute numbers, we don't have a good handle on what is the bioavailability, how much is actually being absorbed by the horse. And then, there, again, there's a whole other myriad of factors that go into that. What is the horse's iron status at the time when it consumes it? Because if it's already quite replete, then absorption is going to be lowered by the horse. There are some regulatory mechanisms to control the amount of iron that is absorbed. Now, again, it does seem that there's horses that are quite sensitive to this iron mode as well. And you start to wonder if there's not some genetic component connected to just some cases where horses don't regulate the iron absorption as well or if it's just simply overwhelmed by the amount of iron that's being consumed. Yeah. But it, it, there's definitely some negative health consequences to too much iron. Again, a, a big part of that is there, we really have limited ways to get rid of iron out of our body. There is We, we lose some. There's a tiny amount in sweat. There's some in dead, endogenous losses and some excretion in urine and feces. But again, very, very low amounts. The main way if you want to get rid of iron out of your body is to bleed, like phlebotomy. Or in humans, you can go give blood. Right. It's the easiest way to get rid of iron sores if they are excessive. Yeah. And can you expand a little more on the effects of iron overload in the horse? Yeah. yeah the, so, again, when you're talking about iron overload, you're more just focused on, like, the insulin resistance right. side yeah. of things? or Yeah. I think, well, I'm thinking yeah. more in terms of, uh, well, as a hoof care provider, I think more in terms of, like, what, what might you see in the health of the feet if they have too much iron that's actually being absorbed in their diet? That's a good question. I, because again, I, I'm not sure. You know, I suppose the answer you want is that you're going to see some deterioration in health quality and horn quality, but I don't know that anybody's actually proven that that's, right. you know, yeah. there's this direct link. So it's hard to say, you know, is this iron overload directly causing it? Or again, is it, it's kind of like with the implication of iron overload and insulin resistance. And there's definitely correlation between high iron levels and insulin sensitivity. In that, like again, back to the phlebotomy, you know, people with type two diabetes, when they give blood for a spell afterwards, are more insulin sensitive. And then we know that insulin resistant horses had like hoof issues, right? Laminitis was eighty percent of laminitis cases are endocrinopathic, right? Yeah. You probably know this better than I do. There's obviously an interaction between iron and hoof health and insulin sensitivity that all go together. But what the direct impact of that iron is on hoof health, I honestly, I'm not sure anybody really knows. Other than we know it's not good, right? Yeah. <laughs> we know iron overload causes lots of problems. I mean, from increased oxidation or oxidation reactions that'll occur and other things that can happen that it's not something you want and you definitely want to control iron intake or at the very least get it balanced you know with enough copper in the diet that you're competitively inhibiting the absorption of any additional iron yeah and can you talk about that you know i've always known to balance the copper and zinc well and manganese technically with the iron in the diet and can you talk about how that helps when you're adjusting the copper and zinc levels in terms of what you're seeing for iron levels like, how does that all work? How do they all interact? Because iron, copper, and manganese use the same absorption pathways through the gut, if you have an overabundance of iron and, like, say, a relative deficiency of copper, that's going to exasperate the copper deficiency even more. Just, again, from the math of there's more iron molecules floating around for absorption than there are copper ones. And so then copper is also involved in iron metabolism as well. So let's say you don't have enough copper in the diet and there's excess of iron. Not only do you have the copper deficiency side of things, you have this physiological problem now too with possibly not enough copper in there to properly process the iron. So you definitely want to ensure that you include enough copper in the diet relative to how much iron's in there. Now, some people get very, very regimented about it being this three to one, four to one, and it's absolutely, it has to be 
compared to your hay. I'm probably not quite as regimented as that as others are. Just understanding that when we do these diets and balance them, as good a job as you did taking your hay sample, there's still a ton of variation, whether it's, you know, talking about from the hay or even just analytical variation from the labs. I mean, they're not perfect either. So that, you know, you take that number and you're like, that's a ballpark. As long as it's under 10 to 1, I, I'm i usually okay. This is okay. Unless it's a case where the horse is particularly sensitive. You know, you're, there's a history of laminitis or like it's a known metabolic case. Then you probably tighten it up a little bit more. But again, as long as it's under that 10 to 1, I'm usually okay with it. I, but I know others are a lot more strict. You want to be like right on 4 to 1 or 3 to 1. But you're having an account for what's in water in those cases. So And then again, the variation that's in the hay. I don't know that we need to be quite that strict. But you do want to ensure you're feeding the right amount of all the trace minerals. Again, it's not just copper and iron. You can't just look at a couple facets that you want to make sure everything's in there and balanced completely. Right, yeah. My name is Jen Dunbar, and I've been feeding my horse Mad Barn for, I think, over eight years now. A friend of mine, she knew that I was having some problems with copper and he had laminitis. So she said, why don't you get rid of that? equalizer crap that you're feeding him and try this and I said well is he gonna eat it because <laughs> he's a real fuss pot so she actually went home to her own barn in her feed room and pulled out a bunch of scoops of it for me and let me try it and he ate it right up so then I moved out here to Newfoundland with copper then he came down with laminitis and it was a whole nightmare and now he has EPID. So I had had him on Mad Barn and was having it shipped out here. And then I talked to Scott and he said with him having his PPID, maybe we should switch him to the amino trace. And I've had him on that now for just over two years. And he looks amazing for a 25 year old horse with cushions. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I mean, where I live, I'm really limited. So if I can do my best with feed and supplements and nutrition to make him feel better, then it's worth it. And the results speak for themselves because he looks fabulous. And so you're talking about hay testing and that's sort of like the next question I had is, you know, when I'm helping clients balance their minerals, I'm, te you know, I'm requesting that they test the hay and looking at the iron and, you know, a, a lot of factors in the hay test. But a lot of yeah. clients, they might not necessarily be able to test their hay. They might get different shipments because they're at a boarding barn, you know, every few weeks or um, it's just not practical where they are. So can you talk a little bit about, you kind of mentioned the, um, the accuracy of the hay test, but can you talk a little bit about how you feel about hay testing and and how we can utilize that? A lot of times when you talk to horse people, you, you start talking about hay testing. I would say a good half of them are like, you know, just kind of brush it off and don't give it much consideration. And tell you put it in perspective, like, how much time did you spend thinking about picking up this bag of feed you purchased for your horse? And usually, they, you know, they've gone into great detail. They've done an internet search and asked all their friends and gone on forums and said, okay, this is the perfect for my feed. And when you look at it, you're like, well, that's making up 10% of the horse's nutrition. The other 90% is coming from the hay. And you have no idea what's in there. And then that usually starts to get bring them around to the idea that, well, maybe it is 40 or $50 well spent, even if we have to do it relatively frequently. And so to your question, I guess, when, you know, if there is hay turning over very frequently and you're like, well, what's the point? We do have large databases of hay samples that can at least get you in the ballpark of where you're likely to be. Certainly, you can access your local labs as well. In Ontario, where I am, we're fortunate, we have, very, we have a handful of labs to do forage analysis. And so we can call them up in any year and say, can we get the summary of all your uh, legumes and grasses for 2020, for the spring of 20? Now, there'd be very few thus far. And they'll send the summary with the deviations. And then so we can use that then as a profile for these people and say, well, you're in this geographic area, so we have a pretty good handle. This is where the trace mineral profile is going to land and then suggest the right of supplementation to go with that. The part where it gets a little tougher is 
the protein and energy content, which is going to have more variation, and that's more dictated by the maturity of cut. And so we end up just estimating by visual appearance where it's at. That's a very crude estimate. But one could argue also that even with a hay sample, DE is a very crude estimate of trying to determine horse's energy intake anyways. But we're focused more on the mineral. So, but from the mineral standpoint, we can usually get a pretty good picture without a hay sample and suggest, okay, here's what your typical hay land, here's what your supplementation program should look like. And where do you find those databases? Is that with any kind of testing company they'll have those? Yeah, they'll all maintain their own databases. So I would just suggest whatever geographic area and pick the lab that's closest to you. Ideally, you're de- probably dealing with a nutritionist or somebody who already has access to that. But if not, you can contact them and they'll usually supply you with the seasonal results for what has come in. And they'll, a lot of times they nicely break it out to even speciate sometimes different types of grasses and like the alfalfa and clovers for you. So that you can get a pretty good handle or estimation. And one of the really cool things that's coming out, I don't know, it's not uh, readily available yet, are these uh, handheld NIR machines that did look like they were going to land in this like two to $300 range <laughs> where you could literally just walk up to your hay and press a button and it would, on your smartphone, it would kick that result, which would be fantastic for those barns that don't have consistent hay supply. It's not going to obviously there's be as accurate as a lab analysis, but if that can at least you know, be a parameterization point to say, okay, now this is where my hay is today and I can go to the lab and pull something that looks very similar to that and use their data to make an estimation then. Not kind of making it sound complicated. It's actually relatively straightforward. Our software at madbarnfeed.com, which is just a feed formulation platform, like it's not a marketing or anything. It's literally just for horse owners can go in and enter the diet. There's a database in there. Now, that's mostly from the northeastern seaboard in, like, Ontario region. So if you live in the west, you would want to update it with your data. But at least, again, it's a starting point for people if they don't have a sample. Yeah, that's great. Well, my name's Katarina Faber. Everyone calls me Kat. I've been using Mad Barton's Amino Trace since August of 2019, I think, is when I started. And... I wish I had started with it sooner, honestly. My mare has severe navicular changes in both fronts, and ever since I've started um, on Amino Trace and cut the rest of the grain out of her diet, she's been sound barefoot, and we're back in heavy work six days a week, barrel racing and jumping, and I can't say enough about Amino Trace. Her top line has never looked better. Her muscle tone has never looked better. Her coat's never looked better. She doesn't fade anymore. She's shiny, glossy no complaints at all and I've probably saved multiple dollars a day in supplement costs because you don't really have to supplement with Amino Trace so it's while I think a lot of people shy away from the initial cost of it I think when a lot of people break it down to their current per day cost it ends up being a lot cheaper because they don't have to do your hoof supplement you don't have to do your magnesium supplement you just don't have to supplement uh, yeah I can't say enough and their bulk minerals and MSM and everything like that too. Saves me a ton in money and they're effective and with no fillers they just it's easy to add. Scott's great with his advice too. I constantly reach out to Scott and excellent customer service and he'll recommend something even if it's not something he sells. If it's what's best that's what he recommends. Yeah no I've had great experiences with Mad Barn. Can't say enough. And so to go on that same vein, a friend of mine has recently started taking supplements and sending them off to be tested because she was curious what the analysis <laughs> on the back was, you know, and how it compared to what their testing came back as. And I know that you said that it's not like their testing is perfect, but what might determine what you put on as the guaranteed analysis and how much room is there for error when you're putting that in the back of a bag? Uh, the regular, so again, it varies. So you're in the U.S., and uh, just to give you a little history on Canadian regulation, we used to always look down to the U.S. And, and say, oh, man, I wish it was like that in Canada. They were so strict in Canada with the feed regulations relatively in terms of like things like labeling and just being able to register and sell products. Now, Canada has since kind of switched more to a U.S. style system, and particularly for horses where they really loosened up on regulation 
in what could be sold here. The other thing was it was ours was done at the federal level, so it was the same all across Canada. Where yours is done at the state level, so it varies depending on which state you're in. Now, for horses, most of them do seem to follow the big horse states and kind of try and keep things consistent. In general, though, you're allowed up to about 15% variation off your tag. Like for instance, what we do is like we run mixer validations to make sure you know one our mixes are consistent, two that yes, what you put in the bag is what you're actually getting in the product. Now we try to keep tighter than 15%. If I was to run a mixer validation and get a 15% variation from my formulation, we would be getting a new mixer. That just is, is too big. But from a regulatory standpoint, that's what you're allowed to have for variation. But again, you know, you come back to mixer validation, it, it is that important because there's a lot of things that happen, and I, I can't speak for other companies because I, I don't know specifically what other people are doing. But if you get, you know, if somebody's getting a product toll manufactured, which a lot of horse companies do because they're simply not big enough to manufacture their own, which is fine. There's no problem with that. But when you move to like a big premix company to manufacture a small run, the variation starts to creep up quite a bit. It could sound like, oh, that was at the end of a flush cycle of the system. And this is kind of, you know, that all ended up in one bag. You know, it's not necessarily trying to not put stuff in other sayings in there. But there, these types of things happen, especially in uh, larger feed manufacturing uh, facilities. Which, is, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off topic here a little bit, but it was one of the reasons why we ended up manufacturing our own products because I honestly never wanted to be in manufacturing. I wanted nothing to do with it. Like, I, I've been in enough feed mills. I know what's involved. It's like, I don't want nothing to do with this. There's lots of people that are good at this kind of stuff. I'll get them to do it for me. And ultimately, it just came down to the size and the quality you needed. You, you ended up having to do it yourself just to change the equipment setup and everything. I mean, those setups that they run are fine if you're making 10 ton of mix or 10 tons of premix at a time. They're not so great when you get them down into these small batches that most horse supplement companies run. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a test because you don't know it. If the people aren't testing and selling, then, you know, these things aren't inexpensive right so you want to get what you're paying for you know? yeah, right. yeah. my name is mary coor burrows i'm an artist a part-time trimmer and a dressage rider you know been a horse owner all my life my mom had a boarding barn and me kind of starting this deep dive into the hoof care and switching their diet uh, a little over a year ago has just been literally a miracle. We have no more thrush, we have no more itchy skin. Um, you know, a, a one horse had chronic CD toe, that cleared up completely, no CD toe. And she's had it all her life, she's 22 years old. And, um, and it's gone. And little by little, the people that I trim for, we have changed those horses' diets. I'm trying to document as their hooves grow in and show the progress. I, I really, I've never had something that I've done with my horses and I've done a lot and I've always been really involved with nutrition for myself and for my horses and I thought I was doing a good job, but just doing this and the amazing thing is just being so simple and also the saving the money. I, I mean, I think I was probably dropping 200 bucks a month to the monthly subscription service where you get in little plastic containers. And yeah. So anyway, that's me. I'm very enthused about it. Yeah, and then the other thing I've noticed is that a lot of the smaller companies or the ones that are really marketing their product towards people like me, like a hoof care provider for their clients, they'll make mostly powdered supplements. And I've talked to a few about why they don't make a pellet version. And they say that it's either, you know, well, I've heard that, you know, oh, well, it can affect the quality of the product or the amount of the minerals or, or vitamins or anything that's in it. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about the that process of making a pellet? <laughs> Well, I more want to talk about the cognitive bias people have when they come up with reasons like the you know, well we don't do it because it affects the vitamins. I, I think it has nothing to do with that at all. I think it has everything to do with setting up a pellet mill costs a lot of money. <laughs> there's a there's a big capital expense involved uh, with doing it. But to your point, to your question, I guess, what's involved in pelleting? I mean, there's different methods for pelleting. Like our method, for instance, is what we call a cold-pressed pellet mill. 
And that's mainly because we make products that have bacteria or yeast in them as well. And you, once you kind of exceed, and it varies, it's a this whole time temperature equation and whether there's steam involved, but anywhere from 60 to 80 degrees Celsius, you start killing all the yeast and bacteria. Uh, so it was just, would not be good for us. Now, most places use a steam injected higher temperature pellet mill, but even those pellet mills don't run nearly as hot as people think they do. And, and not for very long. So the question, back to the direct question, I guess, with the vitamins, like there's a huge industry around feeding animals and vitamins are obviously crucially important for the health of animals. If you couldn't pellet feed, don't you think somebody in the pig or poultry industry would have noticed by now <laughs> that you can't pellet these vitamins? Yeah. So they, they stabilize them. I mean, there's different forms you can buy. Like if you're going to go through extrusion then you'll get a different, like a, coated product that can withstand the extreme temperatures extrusion or if you're just going in a straight mineral vitamin premix you can get a different kind essentially but they know what the vitamin stability is through different processing like we know when we make a mix like a mineral vitamin mixture but yeah the, the vitamins do degrade over time uh, there's no question about it mixing them in with these coarser mixes speeds that up versus just being a pure bag of vitamins but we also know it takes about two years, and the potency is actually higher typically when we start the mix. Uh, so basically, at the end of two years, we can guarantee that potency is still there. Now, we, again, we don't put life, we don't put life of products in two years, but like long as we do is a year on anything with a mineral and vitamin mix, but that ensures that we know at the end of the year that if you still have that product, you're still getting 100% of what's said to be in the bag regardless of whether it's in pellets or it's in the mix oh that's great to know and i mean this is kind of a, a side note but there were some people in our in the hoof care and rehab group that were asking about making a you know treat with minerals in it if their horse wouldn't eat the supplements i mean i don't know why they would eat a treat over like a pellet but <laughs> um if you were to bake a treat would that affect it i mean i guess not right well again it would depend on how at what temperature you're baked it and for how long but most likely it's going to be fine because you're not going to bake a treat at terribly high temperatures and again they do they are conferred some level of protection in the production of the vitamins you're talking about people like who want to make their own treats at home out of yeah. like their mineral mixes yeah. yeah okay that one's actually probably a better question that you know they're more likely to cause destruction doing that so i'm not sure anybody studied like long-term 20 minutes of baking at like 350 or something right right but, uh, i i would still wager you'd fa be fairly safe like, to do that yeah yeah that's good to know so as Scott and I were chatting, I realized we were coming up to the one hour mark and we still had a whole lot more questions to go. So I asked him if he'd be willing to do a part two of a nutrition podcast episode and include some of those questions there. But we started chatting about some of the topics that I want to do in that episode. And so here you'll hear a little bit of a sneak peek of some of those. So you'll be ready for part two when it comes out. So I do have um, a few more questions. One about like equine athletes, because I hear a lot of my clients say, oh, I can't do a forage-based diet because I have a performance horse. <laughs> Go to a best rebuttal. Go to the endurance horse world. I mean, these horses are going 100 miles in a day, and most of them, they'll get a little bit of oats, uh, a lot of beet pulp, oil, and a ton of forage. Yeah. And they can get them to go to 100 miles. Sorry, I you maybe want to save this for a later date, but we can talk about it more. <laughs> I'm with you. I, like, there are definitely ways to formulate diets. Every Any horse size should always be forage first. Yeah. And then yeah. You, work, you work the rest of the diet out as needed. And it's surprising um, when you get it right, you, you know, meet the ecological needs of the horse to want to eat forage for most of the day. You provide the, you, when you provide the right hay, how little actual extra energy and protein supplementation you need to put in there once you get all that taken care of in a good mineral and vitamin balance. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Um, so I didn't know if you could have like a part two episode and I'm happy to do like another phone call in the next, you know, whenever you're available. Does that sound good? Yeah, no, I'm up for it. It's like, like, again, I don't, you maybe want to publish it see if anybody's even remotely interested in anything I have to say. Oh no, they will, they will be for sure try to impress on people like we're doing this really for you and the horse not to 
Because honestly, I'll tell you, like, there's a lot of easier ways to make money than selling horse manure. <laughs> yeah, right. Like when you are working with clients again, like we're more than happy to, uh, like, I mean, feel free to use the Mad Iron Feed. Like, I don't know if you go, when you talk to them about their nutrition, if you get that in depth with them or you're more just general about it. But, uh, like, feel free to use the program, like, because you can set it up and, like, set all your clients up with, like, in a database of your own if you want it. Oh, yeah. Or I might. Like the FDA analysis or but not we're, and like we're continually working on updating uh, any new products that come out just to make it easy for people but you yeah. can always you actually have the ability to push your own product in there if you want it if it's not in the library you just you take a like a something similar and you just adjust the nutrient specs to match what it is and rename it that yeah that sounds awesome i'm always open to feedback like if there's things you're like this would make it so much easier to use i mean there's a bunch of things i already know that we're working on but uh yeah, we're we're always open to feedback to making it better. Yeah, awesome. Um, but it was okay. really great talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, and I really look forward to the next time we chat too. Okay, thanks, Alicia. It's good talking to you. <laughs> Have a great night. Okay. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for part two of an episode with Scott Ciesler. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.